1966 was the year when Mao Zedong launched his cultural revolution and led his Red Guard swimming in the Yangtze River. In another cultural revolution, the Beatles continued to dominate the charts. John Lennon caused a sensation by announcing that the group was more popular than Jesus Christ. Off the coast of Spain, the US Air Force lost and then recovered an H-bomb. Race riots devastated the center of Chicago and other major US cities. And at 6 a.m. on the 14th of July, a girl sat screaming on this ledge. She was one of six nurses who lived in this suburb of Chicago. Neighbors came to see what had happened. The police were called and helped her away. She was Corazon Amaral, who had come to Chicago from the Philippines to nurse. When the police got into the house, they were appalled to find eight dead nurses in the bedrooms. They were Gloria Davy, age 22, Mary Ann Jordan, age 20, Suzanne Farris, 21, Valentina Passion, 23, Patricia Matusek, age 20, Melita Gargulo, 22, Pamela Wilkening, 20, and Nina Schmail, 24. Neighbors in East 100th Street in Jeffrey Manor were aghast as the bodies were brought out. After the police came the forensic scientists. Whoever had done this had apparently left plenty of fingerprints and other clues. All the girls had been stabbed or strangled or both. When she was questioned, Corazon revealed that the killer was a man who had said things which made her think he might be a seaman. She was also able to help an artist draw this detailed picture of the man who had killed her friends. In the forensic laboratory, scientists examined the finger and palm prints found in the house and on this knife. By midday, the description of a man was all over Chicago, including the information that he had a tattoo on his arm, reading, Born to Raise Hell. During routine inquiries at the National Maritime Union Hiring Hall, police discovered that a seaman named Richard Speck had been looking for a ship going to New Orleans. Corazon remembered that the attacker had said he needed money to get to New Orleans. The Coast Guards had a photograph of a Richard Speck. The sketch and the photo matched up closely. When Corazon recognized the face, the police knew that they had identified their man. At nightfall came the news that a man looking like Speck had threatened a prostitute with a gun before disappearing. Now the police had to decide whether to go public. The FBI had found a set of Richard Speck's fingerprints on their file and the scientists at the forensic laboratory worked through the night. At 4.30 a.m. they confirmed that the fingerprints on this knife matched those of Richard Speck. The case seemed so watertight that on the 16th of July, Chicago Police Superintendent O.W. Wilson decided to announce publicly that the suspect they were looking for was named Richard Franklin Speck. That night, while sitting in a bar, Speck heard that he was wanted. He used the false name of B. Bryan to register at the low-level Star Hotel. Cornered and panicking, he slit his wrists with a broken bottle. Fellow guest Claude Lunsford heard him calling for help. When nobody came, Speck staggered to the lobby. He was rushed to Cook County Hospital, but nobody yet realized that B. Bryan was wanted for the murders. B. 
Then his tattoos aroused the suspicions of one of the doctors. This guy just appeared to be uh, the fellow you know, that I thought they were looking for because he had all these tattoos on him. Did you check the tattoos? Yeah, that was the first thing that I looked at. I looked at the, uh, uh, the article uh, uh, that I read. I remember it, uh, he had this one uh, saying uh, in quotes, uh, born to raise hell on his left arm. Did you find it there? Well, it was, the left arm was covered with blood. So uh, the other girls were working on him on the other side, starting an IV. So I took just some regular saliva and I just washed the blood off his arm and I and a bee started coming out and I got, got a little faster and, and it started, it said born, you know, so I went a little bit further and it said born to raise hell. And raise hell he had. Although he was only 24, Richard Speck had a long history of violence and 41 arrests. He was still wanted for burglary in Dallas. He had left a wife and baby daughter there and was being divorced for cruelty. As the police brought in more evidence, so his dossier of rape, burglary, forged checks and robberies with violence grew. He was already the leading suspect in the burglary and rape of an elderly woman and the murder of a barmaid. He was moved to a secure prison hospital, but denied all knowledge of killing the nurses. I can't remember anything, he told the doctors. While crowds gathered outside, the prison medical team ruled that he was not sufficiently recovered to be questioned. He was under sedation and incoherent. Outside, extra police patrolled the grounds. There were two special guards in his room, and he was tied to his bed by leather thongs. However, the medics did allow Corazon Amarao to be driven to the hospital to identify him. Wearing her nurse's uniform, she pretended to be one of the staff of the prison hospital. Once she was out of his hearing, she whispered, that really is him, and collapsed. She confirmed that she had recognized both his face and his voice. Speck suffered what doctors thought might be a heart attack. The prison medical director, Dr. William Norcross, again refused to let him go to court. Medically, it is not thought that he is in sufficient condition. Uh, to see anybody or to engage in any legal proceedings at the present time. When do you think he will be able to go to court, Doctor? I have previously stated, gentlemen, within several days. The police now knew that Richard Speck had been born in Kirkwood, Illinois, in 1941. One of eight children, he had a violent childhood. When he was ten, he fell from a tree and was unconscious for 90 minutes. Caught in a robbery, he was clubbed by a policeman. It is possible that this had injured his brain, already affected by alcohol and drugs. He regularly had blinding headaches. By the 1st of August, he was reckoned to have recovered sufficiently to be taken to court for arraignment. There was intense security. The court appointed a panel of psychiatrists to decide whether he was fit to stand trial. They were not told about the head injuries he had suffered or his long history of drug and alcohol abuse. With no money to pay for a lawyer, Speck was assigned public defender Gerald Getty. Getty entered a formal plea of not guilty and made it clear that he wanted to base his defense on insanity, even though the court-appointed psychiatrists now ruled that Speck was fit to stand trial. The prison psychiatrist was prepared to testify that Speck must have been temporarily insane at the time of the killings due to head injuries or drug use. But the defense case was not helped by remarks reported by Dr. Norcross. I don't recall it exactly, but I think in general it was something to the effect that when I awoke, I saw blood in my hands. They tell me they have this evidence against me. I must have done it. But he did not admit that he had done it. No, he didn't admit he had done it. He just made uh, vague references to the fact that if he had capital punishment, that. Uh, uh, they would never get him to the chair, that he would take care of it himself. Do you believe that he might try to take his own life now? No. You don't Why? think he has suicidal tendencies? No. Why? I just don't. It's a judgment. The defense even tested his chromosomes for the high sex drive caused by the XYY pattern, but were disappointed by the result. The results of both studies is that Richard Speck does not have the XYY chromosome, that he is normal uh, in that regard, that it is only XY. 
just as any other normal person has. His lawyers applied to have the case moved from Chicago, where they said an impartial jury was impossible to find. They cited the police conference, naming him as the murderer. This picture's headline was, This is the Man. They won their argument, and the trial was transferred to Peoria, Illinois, 150 miles away. The prosecution didn't mind, because Peoria was known to lawyers as the Hanging County. With emotions running high, there had been death threats made to Getzbeck. Everyone going into the court was searched every day. Troopers often found concealed weapons, which were widely being carried as protection during the riots which had convulsed the area. This was how Richard Speck had acquired the gun he had been carrying when arrested. He had stolen it from the handbag of a 50-year-old woman he had picked up in a bar and had taken back to his room the night before the murders. Speck's refusal to admit that he was aware of the killings presented his defender, Getty, with a problem. He was unable to plead not guilty by reason of insanity. He now decided to base his defense upon the possibility that Speck had been falsely identified and that he had been elsewhere at the time. The four strong prosecution team felt that it had a convincing case. Led by state attorney William Martin, they prepared to document a narrative inescapably pointing the finger of guilt at one man. Judge Herbert Passion presided as the prosecution set out the events leading up to the night of the murders. They claimed that after Speck had gone on the run from a charge in Dallas, he fled to his sister, who lived in Chicago. When family tensions mounted, he decided to find a ship on which to work his way to New Orleans. On the 10th of July, his sister drove him to the Siemens Hall of the Maritime Union, where he filled in an application form. There were no berths available, but he was told to come back every day. So he hung about, getting drunk and stoned, picking up women as derelict as himself and sleeping in flop houses. On the 12th of July, he was told there was a ship for him, but when he reported in, he was told he was only the reserve. A sailor with more seniority had claimed the passage. He was angry. With no money for a room, he slept rough, and next day borrowed $25 from his brother-in-law. Speck listened impassively as his counsel read out a prosecution statement that on the next day he had pretended he had a check for $1,300. He saw the nurses sunbathing and took a room in a house on the same road where they lived. Then, on the fatal night of the 13th, he fell in with some sailors who were mainlining some kind of drug from a blue bottle. He didn't know or care what, and he did the same, injecting a clear liquid into his arm. The spectators who crowded into the courtroom heard the prosecutor charge that, giddy with drugs and drink, Richard Speck knocked on the nurse's door at around 11 o'clock. William Martin then called his key witness to take the witness stand and continue the horrific story. Corazon Amaral seemed calm and surprisingly composed as she arrived at court. She repeated her identification of Speck as the man who had massacred her friends. She then took up the story of that evening at the nurse's home. Six of the girls had been talking in one of the bedrooms when there was a knock on the door. Corazon went down and opened it. A tall, pockmarked man was standing there. In his hands were a gun and a knife. I'm not going to hurt you, he said. I just need your money to get to New Orleans. As shown on this model, which was used in the courtroom, he then herded the six girls into the largest of the bedrooms and bound their wrists and ankles with a sheet torn into strips. At 11.30, Gloria Davy, another of the girls who lived in the house, returned from a date. She too was tied up in the bedroom. 
The man then selected one of the girls and took her out of the bedroom. She was Pam Wilkening. The others heard her give a deep sigh. Then there was silence. They argued about whether to resist, but most thought it best not to provoke him. Two more girls now came home. Suzanne Farris lived in the house and she brought back a friend, Mary Ann Jordan. They were intercepted by the man who stabbed them both and left their bodies in one of the other bedrooms. He then took Nina Schmael out of the main bedroom and strangled her. While he was gone, Corazon rolled under one of the beds and squeezed against the wall out of sight. Now there were four girls dead and five more waiting, huddled in the main bedroom. Next, he dragged Valentina Passion away and stabbed her neck without untying her. Corazon testified that at this point, another of the Philippine girls, Melita Gagulo, shouted, Mascarit, it hurts, in her native tongue, after she had been taken to a different room. Now, Patricia Matusek was pushed to the bathroom where she was kicked and stabbed on the floor. Finally, the killer returned to the bedroom where only Gloria Davy was to be seen. Corazon saw the killer tear off her jeans before taking her out. Her strangled body was found downstairs. The killer had lost count of how many girls there had been and now left the house not realizing Corazon was still under the bed. She stayed there until 6 a.m. before she dared to get out. Then she smashed the window screen in the front room and crawled out onto the narrow ledge where she screamed in Filipino for help. The prosecution was delighted with her testimony. When asked to identify the man she saw in her house that night, she marched across the floor of the courtroom and pointed her finger close to Richard Speck's nose. This is the man, she declared. The Chicago Daily News court reporter called her the greatest trial witness I have ever seen. Detectives were sure that the files of evidence they took into court built up into an unanswerable case. But Gerald Getty, Speck's lawyer, was not beaten yet. Unable to use the defense of insanity because Speck would not confess, he started by bringing Speck's family to court as character witnesses. Then he produced a witness to give Speck an alibi, a bartender who swore he was at a bar from 12 to 12.30 a.m. on the fatal night. If he was, he couldn't have been at 2319 East 100th Street. The man said he would stake his life that it was Speck who had a hamburger at his bar that midnight. His wife backed him up. If the jury believed the couple, a terrible miscarriage of justice would be avoided, with an innocent man condemned for what the coroner had called the crime of the century. In his closing speech, Getty attacked the fingerprint evidence as being based on smudges, and Corazon's identification of the man she watched while in such an emotional state as faulty. The talking was over. For two weeks, the jury had heard horrific descriptions and seen ghastly photographs. Now it was up to them. A long vigil was expected. But it took this jury only 49 minutes to reach their eight verdicts, guilty with the recommendation of death. A wave of relief swept through Chicago and the nation. Justice would be done. The trial was over, but the legal battles continued for defense attorney Gerald Getty. Despite the massive evidence against his client, he was determined to fight on. What can you tell us about your Well, uh, all I can say is we tried this case to the best of our ability. We feel that we tried it in the best traditions of the legal profession. Uh, the jury has spoken, and our only alternative now is a motion for a new trial. And all cases where the death penalty is given in this state must be appealed. 
Although he had yet to pass sentence, Judge Passion joined in the celebrations, shaking the hands of members of the victims' families and commiserating with them. The defense request for a new trial was quickly squashed. But now came a new objection. Was Richard Speck suffering from a form of epilepsy that night? A panel of court-appointed doctors shot that down. So, was he insane? Now the fact that he killed the nurses had been proven. His lawyer could at last argue that he was legally insane at the time. Judge Passion heard a defense psychiatrist testify that Speck had long suffered from a severe chronic personality disorder. It wasn't enough. On the 5th of June, Judge Passion sentenced Richard Franklin Speck to be put to death in the electric chair. As he had throughout the trial, Speck showed no emotion. The appeal led to a stay of execution when the Supreme Court of the United States ruled that jurors opposed to capital punishment had been wrongly excluded from Speck's case. Then at the end of 1967, it called a halt on all executions in the United States. So on the 20th of September, 1972, the Illinois Supreme Court commuted Richard Speck's death sentence. Two months later, he was resentenced to eight consecutive terms of at least 50 years each, the longest prison sentence ever handed down. He spent 19 years in Stateville, the prison at Joliet, Illinois. He never admitted to the murders of the nurses or to any of the several other killings of which he was suspected. He was a model prisoner, content to pass his days growing fat, 200 pounds in the end. So settled was he in jail that although he was theoretically eligible, he didn't ask for parole until 1987, when he made the gesture of an application. He was not surprised when the parole board turned him down. In 1991, he died in prison of a heart attack. He was one day short of his 50th birthday. A tremendous hoax involving the reclusive multi-billionaire Howard Hughes is part of tomorrow's Great Crimes and Trials Double from Five. Stay with us for the real NCIS next and the agents have to identify bones discovered on a naval base and then find a killer.